Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. This is the 19th of July. Um, new videos this week. I actually just finished recording yesterday a 50 minute deep dive on the Azure Load Balancer. So if you want to understand how it works, the various inbound flows I can control and the rules, how I can control outbound, um, probably worth a fairly long look. So have a drink first. New features this week. So Azure Compute actually quite a lot of updates. Firstly, there is now a service level agreement for single instance virtual machines. Now, previously, uh, in the beginning, we needed at least two virtual machines to get an SLA. I could use availability set, which would give me a 99.95% SLA, or availability zones that gave me a 99.99% SLA. Well, then they introduced, hey, I can have a single VM, and I could get a 99.9% .9 SLA if it was a premium SSD. So what they've now done is, well, that applies to Ultra as well, but if I use a standard SSD, I can get a 99.5% SLA. If it's a standard HDD, 95% uh, SLA. So really probably <laughs> want to be using the premium SSD for productions. And again, still ideally, I want multi instances for that kind of best SLA. And Microsoft do kind of walk through these. If we go and look at the SLA document, it talks about, hey, those particular options spelling out the different 99.99 all the way through to the 95%. So now we have that available to us. Um, AKS node pool. So remember with AKS, the management, the API service, the scheduler, the etcd database, that's all managed for us. Then we have node pools, and these are the groups of virtual machines that will actually run the pods that host the containers. And I have multiple node pools. So what we can now have is this DCS v2. This is the Intel SGX, the Software Guard Extensions, which basically creates that secure enclave that's only decrypted within the processor itself. So it's really protecting it from everything. Well, I can now use those to create node pools. So I can actually leverage that technology um, within my AKS environment. The DAV4 and EAV4 are now available in more regions. So these use the AMD processor. So the D is the general purpose, the E is the memory optimized. And again, if we kind of jump over and look at that, we can actually see it talks about kind of all the new regions that are coming but also better to support for availability zones. I don't want them just in one data center. I want them in multiple data centers so I can still have zone resilient services deployed in those regions. So this is really gonna light that up. From a networking perspective, um, a lot around private link as we would expect. Remember private link lets me take a service and project an endpoint into a virtual network. I then talk to that endpoint, which is an IP in my VNet, to talk to that PaaS service or some custom service behind a standard load balancer. So now Azure Automation supports private link. I can actually go and connect to the various services through that endpoint on my virtual network. Azure Site Recovery now supports private link as well. And this is really based around two things. So one is the sort of the recovery services vault itself, but then also one to kind of the storage where I go and actually perform my rights to as part of that replication. So we can now do that for the Azure Site Recovery. And that's gonna work both for virtual machines running in Azure through the mobility service agent. We'll now talk to that private endpoint for replication. But if I have things on premises, if I have physical boxes, if I have VMware, Hyper-V, if they're on a network that has a connectivity to the virtual network in Azure that has the private endpoint, well, they'll be able to use that as well, providing they have the right DNS zones for the, the private link resolution. So now I don't have to go and use those public endpoints. Azure File Sync, that also now has private link support. And again, that, that's kind of two parts to that. I need the Azure Files endpoint on the VNet, then also the Storage Sync service that has a separate endpoint. So I have those two endpoints onto the virtual network, 
Well now again, networks that are connected, they can use those private endpoints. I don't have to use a public endpoint for that kind of resolution. There's now built-in health monitoring for load balancers. And it's actually really nice. So there's a whole set of insights really about everything that's happening today in all the different services. And these insights are designed to give me this curated view uh, created by the people that create the feature. There's probably the metrics I care about, the visualizations I care about. So now if we look at the networks that's in preview right now, I can actually go and look at my load balancers and I can kind of see the load balances I have in my environment, or I can see my SNAP connection count, my SIN count, my data path, my health probe status, all looks good. I can actually go and drill down into one of these, and then within there, go and look at the insights, and I get a few different things. So I'll actually get kind of on the right, I get some detailed metrics, I get some views about what's happening, but we also get this great visualization. Here you can see, hey, look, I've got kind of two endpoints going to this Kubernetes load balancing rule that goes to this back end pool. Then I've got an outbound rule that goes to a different IP address. So I'm using a different IP for outbound and I've got multiple inbound to my services. So it gives me that visualization. I can see details about the sort of traffic that's coming in. So nice to have these kind of additional insights coming in for the various services and now includes load balancer. There's now third-party NVA support in an Azure Virtual WAN Hub. And if we think about what that means is ordinarily I can think about, well, in Azure, I have kind of that main kind of virtual WAN router. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. I might have ones around express route gateways. I might have a site site VPN gateway in there. I might have a point to site, and these give me all these connections to different things. Maybe it's a, a big head office where I've got some big important looking building, and I'm using kind of express route. Then I've got a smaller site where I'm using a site to site. I've got some user kind of sitting there doing a point to site. But now what I can actually do is in Azure, I can put an NVA in that VWAN network, for example, Barracuda, it has connectivity to that main router like everything else. So now I could actually have a location that's using that kind of third party SD-WAN, this software defined WAN, and it can go and then hook into its matching appliance in Azure Virtual WAN to give me super simple connectivity. So again, the example right now, I think is Barracuda. So I've had this Barracuda kind of appliance there. I could have the Barracuda NVA integrated, just makes it easier to get different services hooked into this overall Azure-based SD-WAN um, with that support. So, cool feature. Storage side, um, shared disks are now GA. So shared disk was all about the idea that, hey, um, for premium and for ultra, I can actually support things now like SCSI persistent reservations, also this Stonef block uh, device fencing. And it essentially allows me to share disk between multiple virtual machines. And it really behaves just like any other data disk. I can't share an OS disk. But basically we have this property. We have this max shares value on the disk. Now I can only change this if the disk is unmounted from any VM. Um, so the premium disks, it ranges from, if it's a P15, I think a P20, I can have two max shares, max value, so two VMs connected. If it's a P30, 40, 50, I can have five. If it's a P60, 70, 80, I can have 10. Um, ultra, it's five for all of them. And really, it's exactly what the name suggests. So I can now have my virtual machines. And I did a whole separate video on Azure Shared Disk where I demo this with a 2019 um, Windows cluster. But essentially, I still have kind of the dedicated OS disk. So I still have that. But now I can have a separate data disk that they could both connect to. That would be seen as this shared storage. They can do these SCSI persistent reservations. I could use it for SQL clusters. Um, cluster shared volumes, Oracle, 
you kind of name it, I now have that. And again, that's going to work across Windows and Linux. So that has now uh, actually GA'd. As part of that, um, SQL Server 2019 on Windows Server 2019, those failover cluster instances um, is now in preview support with those shared disks. So I can actually now use uh, SQL Server 2019 on Server 2019 and leverage that as part of that failover um, cluster instance. So it's different from availability groups. Availability groups, I don't have shared storage. SQL just replicates the data. I have a local instance on each. This is actually a shared storage where I'm hosting the database. The other nice thing about SQL Server 2019 and Windows Server 2019 is I have the distributed network name. And again, I talk about that in my shared disk video. In the past, we had to kind of have a name that was maybe on a load balancer to have for the cluster name, for cluster resources. With a distributed network name, it just resolves to all of the IP addresses of the nodes. So I don't have to maybe put an Azure load balancer in front of it anymore. So it simplifies the deployment. Import export of disks uh, now works via private link. So if I have a managed disk, Remember, it abstracts from the storage account. There's still a storage account there, but the page blob that stores the actual disk is really hidden from me. The managed disk is a first-class citizen. That's what I see as an ARM object. But if I want to import into it or export, what we do is we get a temporary shared access signature. So now what I can actually do is, well, I can actually leverage that through a private endpoint. So I don't actually have to go and access via the, sort of the public uh, URLs. I can actually create a private endpoint for that shared access signature that is used for the import and export uh, of a managed disk. And there's now a new performance tier option for premium SSDs. Now this is in preview. Now ordinarily, for the smaller premium SSDs, I can burst. I, I can use more IOPS and throughput than I normally could for a fairly small window. I think it's 30 or 60 minutes. What this lets me do is for a longer period of time, like a day or two days, I've got some really busy shopping day, I can actually change the performance tier. I'm not going to change the capacity. The capacity will stay the same, but now I can increase the IOPS, the throughput, for a couple of days. I'm going to pay more money and then dial it back down. But it saves me having to make the disk bigger. Ordinarily, for premium SSDs, the capacity and the IOPS and the throughput scale linearly. Bigger disk, bigger performance. With this, it's more like the Ultra SSD that lets me have individually tune capacity, throughput, IOPS. So with this feature, I can actually now say, hey, I don't want to change the capacity, but I need to increase my performance for a limited time, a couple of days. So I'll pay a bit more for a couple of days, and then I can turn it back down again. Also now at the container level, I can turn on or off um, if I want to have anonymous access to just the blobs or the blobs and the container. It's just a setting at the container level of the container. Miscellaneous. Uh, Azure AD sign in with my email address. For most people, this won't mean anything because it's like that's what I do already. But that's because your email address is the same as your UPN, your user principal name. That's not the case for everyone. For some people, the user principal name is actually different. Like on premises, my UPN, which is based around my domain name, might be john at um, na.itservices.savletech.net. But my email is john at savletech.net. And what we could do is we could have an alternate logon in AD, so we kind of hid that from the user. Now, when we move to Azure AD, we really want the UPNs to match. Otherwise, things like Microsoft 365, Office 365 can get very upset. But that would now mean the users would have to use their UPN, which they're not really used to using, in Azure AD. So with this new capability, the proxy addresses, which is what stores those email addresses, it's replicated via Azure AD Connect. Now I'm actually going to say, hey, look, I want you to use an alternate ID logon for the user. So now I can use my email address, which is what I'm kind of used to seeing 
to log on to services that use Azure AD. Um, there's a new Azure AD policy I'm going to create, and that will then enable me to log on with my email address. So this is kind of like in preview, but it's going to make life a lot simpler for those organizations that do have a different UPN uh, from their email address, better user experience. Um, Azure Monitor for SAP. So SAP, SAP HANA, these are uh, big deployments. Uh, they might take up Godzilla size virtual machines. They might be bare metal deployments. But there are aspects of the SAP HANA, the database. There's aspects of Azure Resource Manager. So what this Azure Monitor for SAP Solutions does is it really brings things together. Um, I deploy this solution. It deploys to a managed resource group, uses log analytics. And what it actually does is it brings together the telemetry around Azure Resource Manager and SAP. It gives me these great visualizations. And because it's built on log analytics, uh, I can create my own dashboards. I can use the dashboards they provide. I can create custom visualizations. I can run Custo queries. I can create custom alerts. But it's going to give me a much easier um, experience in terms of um, monitoring my SAP solutions hosted in Azure. And that's it. Um, I hope you found this useful. If it was, please like, comment, share, subscribe. And uh, until next week, take care. And tomorrow will probably be better.